We have noticed a great change in the students' behaviour. They feel a lot more supported. Um, we do check-ins Monday, Wednesday, Friday every morning, first thing as a support faculty. Here they feel that they belong and they're cared for. We can resolve issues a lot quicker and students feel like they've been heard and valued. We initially reached out to um, real schools because we wanted to address a couple of concerns within our school around consistency. Our teachers could be more consistent. Um, they try very, very hard, but we're all selling a different message, whereas now we're all selling the same message. And I find that that has seen great value in the first six months. Before, like, this whole new script that the teachers sort of have been given, I think that students weren't really actually listening to what the teachers were saying, but I think now students are realising that they really should be paying attention and that the teachers are doing it for their own good. The teachers have changed a lot. I feel like with real schools helping them, they've become more consistent and there's more of a format on how they deal with students and, you know, help them into the class and the lessons flow a lot smoother. The videos that Cassie produced for us uh, were short and sharp and concise. They were to the point that allowed staff to understand what's being said, how they can implement things, and then what they could expect as an outcome from using her key points. They used terminology that we had already implemented already. She read the room and she understood what we were doing, and she was able to then develop that in video form for us that we were able to then pick up and then run with really easily. We constantly enjoy when she comes to visit. She's very professional. But the fact that she has all that knowledge from being there as a past principal, it really assists us because she knows what we feel like on, on the ground running. She knows exactly how we feel. So that really assists with everything. The interaction with Cassie from day one has been nothing but professional um, and the staff really appreciate all the time that she gives to, to us. Staff have come on board so quickly with this process with rural schools because they see the value that it adds to our school and achieving success for, for not only staff but also for our students in the community. We noticed after COVID that children can't regulate their emotions for whatever reason uh, is going on in the community, coming back and trying to interact with each other, talk with each other, solving problems, it's just not happening. So Real Schools has been able to give us the language to use and actually made us reflect on how we are in the classroom as teachers. For the children, the biggest advantage for them is that they feel like they're heard. So they come in, they get to express how they're feeling in the morning. And I can see it impacting other areas of the curriculum too, whether it be a reading lesson and we're talking about how a character might be feeling, they're able to identify those emotions and feelings and use effective statements better as well. I reached out to Real Schools because I had worked with Adam previously in a different setting and I just loved his approach to school culture. So that's why I got in touch because even though we already did have quite a good school culture here, I really felt that it could be enhanced with the work with real schools. I was a little sceptical at the beginning. I've done restorative practice before. The way that Cassie has interacted with us and has got us to talk about it as a group, we do our teacher circles, so we're actually talking about our feelings, how we want the day to be. It's really made us reflect on that. And so moving forward, it is going to only be positive for us and for the students that we're teaching. I was fortunate enough to have Cassie come into my classroom and conduct a emotional circle where they're just coming from lunch. She really understood how they were feeling in order to take that into consideration for the lesson that she was going to teach. All the kids were engaged. They were captivated by her energy and how passionate she was, even though she was a complete stranger to them. They just knew that she was there to help them. She's a really amazing person. I like the fact that she's personable and uses stories She's like a normal teacher here at school. She's someone who fits in. She's got the experience and she doesn't stand out as just an instructor. She sort of blends in. I think that's one of the best things about having Cassie um, here at Phone Court. It didn't matter what question we threw at her or what scenario we gave her. She had an answer um, instantaneously for us or a story of something similar that had happened that she, we could relate to. So, yeah, Cassie was great. In 12 months' time, I would like consistency across the school with staff in how they are managing student behaviours. They already do a fantastic job, but that is the goal, that everyone is consistent with their approach. Being able to have the kids reflect on their behaviour and not to always 
want to retaliate as the first point of conflict, to be able to recognize their emotions and self-regulate and be able to remove themselves from the situation and then use those practices on their own out in the real world, not just in the classroom. And if we can teach them that, then I think we've done our job properly. Welcome, everyone. Fabulous to have you all here. I hope, you're, um, I hope you've had a good day at school. Um, my name is Adam Voigt. I am the, the founder and the CEO of Real Schools. I um, have been in this job for, I guess, the last 11 years or so, and it followed two substantive principalships in which I um, certainly leveraged the power of working restoratively. Uh, to underpin the culture of my schools. And I, if I'm really honest, I think it underpinned my whole success. And um, and it's why I've become so passionate about sharing that with others across the last 11 years or so. Um, what we're going to do in the, the webinar today is to provide you, first of all, with an understanding of um, what it means to implement restorative practices, given that there's a high compulsion upon New South Wales schools to do that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that it is a webinar. You'll see me look around and, and have a look at the attendee list from time to time and see if anybody's got their hand up, see if anybody's put anything in the chat box. Um, so please remember that you can inter inter interact today. Um, and I did notice in the registration list that while there is a high predominance for obvious reasons of New South Wales school leaders in the audience today, um, got some sneaky ones that have snuck in from interstate and even from New Zealand. So um, welcome wherever it is that you're joining us from. Um, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians, I should say, of the, the land on which I'm joining you from today, which is Bunurong country on the beautiful Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. And I'd like to honour those custodians, uh, past, present and emerging, wherever it is that you find yourself joining us from across New South Wales or elsewhere. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to do today is that you can see as my title screen today is uh, is the cover of a white paper that I've written on the challenge that's being faced by chiefly New South Wales um, school leaders around implementing restorative practices. And it was the impetus for it clearly came uh, with the release of the IER uh, policy and um, and the noticing that we were starting to shift away from recommendations and endorsements around practicing restoratively in schools to mandating them. And um, the schools that I certainly work with in New South Wales and that we do at Real Schools have done an incredible job um, being able to, one, comply with the policy and two, thrive as a result of that work. Um, and I guess the, the first videos that I wanted to show you today were just... Um, I think sometimes we can get a little down at the moment around the, the challenges that we face in schools. And I wanted to, if nothing else, give you a little bit of hope um, because this work not only is something that New South Wales schools need to do in order to keep themselves professionally compliant with not only the IR policy, but several other connected policy. I'll talk about that a little further as we go. Um, but to be able to get those enormous benefits of working restoratively because they exist, they're out there, and um, I'd love your school to have them. Um, so I'll get myself going, and what I want to do is begin with the formation idea of this policy. And my contention first up that the policy, uh, the IAR policy itself, and then more specifically the restorative practices mentions that happen within the policy, I think are a genuinely worthy ambition. And I think that there's a terrific opportunity for New South Wales schools to, and look, perhaps the reason that we get people from other states coming along to events like this is because we all know that when New South Wales you know, sneezes, the rest of the country gets a cold. Um, but I actually think there's an incredible opportunity here for New South Wales schools to genuinely make one of the, one of the more foundational and more positive um, shifts in direction in education that this country has ever seen. And I genuinely mean that. And that's why I use a, a picture like the whole idea of seizing the, st the sword from the stone, um, is that this isn't an add-on. This isn't an opportunity to do something that's just a little bit different. This isn't even an opportunity to do something that follows the usual rules of implementation in schools that we've been following for many decades now, which is let's ask schools to do really big things. Let's give them a lot to do around that really big thing. Um, for instance, the implementation of new program and policy. And then let's watch it improve things just a little bit. 
Um, I think that's unfair. The joy of working restoratively is that it is the antithesis of the intention that you should do really big things that improve things a little bit. Um, this is entirely around small shifts. And I'll talk shortly about the, the model that we use to get that done in schools. It's about small shifts that are, that give you the opportunity for the potential of a large of a large change. And um, I think teachers everywhere are screaming out for that. Now, when we do take this opportunity and we do accept the worthy ambition of implementing restorative practices in your schools, we follow an, an, an opportunity to impact young people and community in a number of different ways. Um, the research body is incredibly strong around restorative practices well implemented. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it not implemented well in, in the past, but the, the research body is really strong around the ability to reduce student suspensions as a starting point. And we all know that that's a fundamental government ambition behind this policy. Um, and we all also know that it's kind of easy sometimes to tell people to to reduce suspensions by telling them to suspend less. Um, but what we want to do is to have a practice-based um, approach to bringing down student suspensions. Effectively, what we're looking to do is to have less suspendable incidents happen in your school and to, as a result, reduce student suspensions. There's also incredible opportunities to improve young people's mental health, uh, their resilience, their anxiety levels, by letting them know that we have a plan for the people in the school and that there is a repeatable process, whatever it is that can go wrong. And there are millions of different possibilities around that in a school. Um, but we do want them to know that we've got a plan, that it's all good. Everything's under control. And the end game is slightly different than the one that we've experienced previously. Um, one of the, the beautiful parts for me of working restoratively is that the really clear end game of a young person erring, getting something wrong, getting themselves stuck in the middle of conflict or, or um, making a wrong choice is personal responsibility and being thanked and congratulated for it. And when they know that that's the end game, we start to get reductions in things like lying. Um, and we get to the point where, as was mentioned so eloquently in that Fern Court video, young people who self-regulate. That's, that's what we're looking for. The research systemically around bullying is incredibly strong. Um, the the work particularly done by the University of London in 2012 points to this, where almost 1,400 schools were, were looked at who were succeeding, who were reducing bullying frequency and severity, and they found that of the top 10 implementations that they were using in their school, about six or seven of them could be directly attributed to a restorative intention, which is um, highly encouraging. Um, and there's also, uh, for me, some really profound research, particularly for our schools who are in low socioeconomic areas, around how prolonged exposure to a restorative model um, is about the most significant um, research proven inter interrupter to the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that's before we even talk about teachers. Um, the thing that I think produces all of these possibilities for, for schools is that we're finally adopting a methodology that is embedded in some really clever brain science. Um, brain science around the way that young people learn to socialise in a typical community, even young people who are living in the most rapid period of change that any school, any any people have, have encountered in our human history. Um, and it's also built on some really, found, really bright research that's been done around things like affect theory, around how we ex actually experience and respond to emotion rather than a hypothetical construct. And most of the hypotheticals that have been developed that schools have been compelled to implement over a really long time, I would contend are about use. So the hypothetical is that if we build this program, you will use it. Not that it'll change the way that young people are built. And I think that that it needs to change. And I am delighted to see the little like kernel of gold that sits within the opportunity at the moment to finally change that once and for all. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that the restorative intention behind the IAR policy, and not only the IAR policy, but the other connected policies that sit behind it. I know that I did my research on this and we found references and of endorsements and recommendations around schools practicing restoratively in the, the New South Wales Behaviour Code of Conduct in the mental health framework for New South Wales schools, in New South Wales, in the New South Wales ex School Excellence Framework, and also in the New South Wales Wellbeing Framework. But there are also five 
probably six different really specific recommendations in the IER policy that kind of add up to this movement away from endorsement and recommendation towards mandate. What does the what does the tightrope look like, and why, for instance, is the white paper talk, talk about talking about being caught in an implementation gap? It's because it's kind of figuratively how I see this. Um, New South Wales schools are finding themselves in one destination, and they need to get to another. And the problem is, there's no road. Um, in fact, there's a, a gap. <laughs> there's a there's a gulf, <laughs> um, and it has a tightrope. And I think that walking that tightrope is is fraught because you have on one side of the, of this a frankly exhausted and overwhelmed workforce who have varying levels of skill around working restoratively. Um, you have at your avail varying levels of resource available to you to get those people up and moved across that tightrope. You have varying levels of knowledge about what a sound contemporary restorative framework should look like in, a, in an Australian school. And you have varying, varying levels of will and interest. Yeah. And some of that's um, attached to previous experience. You know, some people have used restorative practices before and had a poor experience of it, where they've had a model rolled out by people who, who don't genuinely understand what the, the busyness and the business of, of an Australian school these days is. Um, and you've, had people, you've got people who are quite wed to the old punitive system um, the old crime and punishment system. And it takes work you know, in order to convince those people that they should even put their toe on the tightrope. It feels dangerous to them to abandon some of those, some of the, some of those things that they've committed themselves to in their in their years, if not decades of practice. And um, that places principles in a really tricky spot. You know, how do you how do you get them there with all these risks in in intact, in in, in position? Um and I also think that the New South Wales Department of Education is walking a tightrope on this um, because I suspect they know. They know that they're asking schools to move towards a restorative future um, and they also know they don't have the resources to help them, that they don't have enough behaviour advisors, they don't have enough experience, they don't have a clear model for practicing restoratively. They don't have enough resources and they don't have enough knowledge about how to apply a, a simple explicit practice framework in such a way that it brings the wide variety of people with all of those knowledge, skill, experience and will variabilities from one practice model to another. Um, and that's in some ways dangerous because the middle of the tightrope is no place to live. And it is not okay for us to make a declaration that we're going to have restorative New South Wales schools and leave people stuck in the middle. And so I think that there's a there's a risk for people who are, I don't know, we've got some people who are joining today from the from the Department of Education who are working in support of schools. And I don't say this to criticize, I say this because I see you. And I I know that that's a risk that's felt. And I know that the, the risk of leaving people stuck in the middle there is confusion. Um, it's conversations that take us nowhere around where is the line between our restorative model and other models that we're kind of throwing at and endorsing in, in our schools. And it's a recipe for failure and inconsistency. Um, one of the joys of practicing restoratively is that once you are all in, once you get people to the other side, is that the consistency thing is finally achieved. Not in terms of consistency of outcome, because we just can't do it. Um, philosophically, it's just about impossible to treat every punch the same and to treat every square the same, um, because we will disappoint people when we're unable to match their expectations around perception of severity. Um, but what we can do is promise consistency of process, and we can invite all of our stakeholders into understanding that really simple, consistent approach and we can ask them to call us on it when we get it wrong. And I do. I have from time to time gotten it wrong. And the great part about when this becomes a, a cultural fit for your school is it creates a safe space where we don't need to defend. We're able to say, yeah, I think I did, considering the wild variable of hundreds of young people you know, coursing with both disadvantage and hormone that come into my school every day. <laughs> Yeah, occasionally I get it wrong. Um, we backtrack, we get it right, we fix it, we get a positive result for everyone. 
And it's a philosophy that people feel that they can genuinely step into when it's articulated well for them. So I think that there's ways for us to avoid the, the pitfalls that we've got here that exist between ambition and reality. Um, but they're real nonetheless. And it is really important that we identify them so that we can so that we can safely make this trip. As I mentioned before, the one thing I haven't done yet is speak to the, the opportunity that exists for your teachers in seizing that sword, you know, in taking the restorative bulls by the, bull by the horns and deciding that your school is going to be ahead of the mandate curve when it comes to working restoratively. Um, for me, uh, when I first started to practice as an educator restoratively, I noticed that there were two key impacts and they haven't changed for me across a, a really long period of time. Um, number one is that I was more effective. Um, I genuinely feel that young people make more progress, both academically and socially, um, when I am practising restoratively and getting better at it in the company of really clever colleagues every single day. And I like that. You know, it feels good to know that my work is having an impact. It feels good to not finish a day feeling that I'm banging my head against a brick wall, to know that my practices um, are doing the job, are standing up to the rigours of being in an Australian classroom. Um, the second benefit that I've gotten from practising restoratively is a reduced stress level. And I mean that authentically. What do we know? about what is stressing Australian and indeed New South Wales teachers. Um, the research is quite clear that the number one stressor is still student behaviour. There are numbers of others, um, but student behaviour still comes in at the highest possible um, factor. And that's not okay. We can't have teachers going home every day feeling that their practice doesn't match up to their purpose. They can't have, them, can't have them feeling that they're going home every day having deployed strategy that doesn't line up with their deep reasons for getting into education in the first place. I don't want to have environments where young people are failing behaviourally. I want to have environments where they're thriving, where they're achieving, where there's some smiles on people's faces. And when I practice restoratively, I know one thing, and that's that when I get home every night and put my head on the pillow, um, my practice that I used that day whether it worked or not, because sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes in schools, you just get unlucky and our beating ourselves up over outcomes over which we can't control is something that stops in a restorative model. It liberates the notion that we can get we can get things wrong occasionally and get away with them, but also sometimes get things right and still not win. But I put my head on that pillow every night knowing that my practice was really close to my purpose, my reason for working with young people. And this is a story that we're finding is being repeated over and over again within our partner schools. The research on practicing restoratively that we are generating in our schools at the moment tells us that our teachers are experiencing better levels of well-being, better levels of mental health, lower levels of anxiety, um, more resilience. And again, I think that that's a really good thing and something that we could we, we should continue to be aspirational around. So there's an opportunity that exists for every individual teacher in your school. But being school leaders, I wanted to be really clear today around the opportunity that exists for your school and how you can prove the impact of working restoratively and taking the, the effort to choose a different model, despite the fact that it doesn't have all the artifacts of programs like mini lessons that you need to implement and modules and resources that you have to engage with, that you can get some really fabulous results with these small changes. We were privileged um, last year to have our Victorian schools who have worked with us to provide what they refer to as their panorama reports. So the panorama reports work in such a way that, um, that they provide a, a number of different data sets across various areas. I'm just realising that I've shifted the slide on your slightly there. I think I've, I think I've been able to artfully recover on that. Um, and they speak to the three key stakeholder groups that we engage in our restorative schools. Um, so for a start, we were able to measure across a three-year period what the impact was in three areas that pertain chiefly to students. So around the student perception around effective classroom behaviour, there were significant improvements, as were there around their perception of effective teaching time being higher in their schools and also around their sense of connectedness. Now, for two other areas, we talk to teachers, we look at what, what the teacher perception is, and they said quite significantly that there had been shifts positively in terms of school climate and in terms of staff trust in each other. Now, where does trust come from in an organisation? 
Um, trust is a really interesting and sometimes hard to capture, you know, concept. Feels a little bit like you're chasing a butterfly sometimes. Um, hard to capture, but also easy to generate. Um, in the, the research on trust is reasonably clear that all you really need to do to build trust in an organisation is get really clear on the behaviours, on the conduct, on the practice that we're going to deploy as an organisation and then get really busy thanking and congratulating each other for doing it. And what we find in a restorative school and we let go of the notion that it has to work every time and this outcomes obsession that's distracting us from good practice is find that our schools start to thank and congratulate and support each other to do the good practice and then see what happens. And as a result, we get higher trust environments. Making the commitment does not provide a higher trust environment. What we know provides that is the simple act of thanking and congratulating for people who keep it. And then we also found when we looked at the responses that came in terms of perception from parents, that we had a significant overall, we combined some of the data here to try and make it easier for you to engage with. Um, we combined that and, we, and found that we had a significant increase from parents in terms of their general satisfaction of the school which we think is a really positive thing. Um, one of the things that we're gonna do after the webinar today is send you a little pack. So with the, the white paper that will be sent to you, whether you're um, in the webinar today or whether you're watching it individually, is that we're going to send through this data to you so that you can have a look at it amongst an, a number of other resources that can hopefully get you started as well. But you know what? There are some other key things that we know schools are responsible for that we wanted to bring to your attention. In our Victorian partner schools across a three-year trip, what we found was there was an average decrease in total suspensions, student suspensions each year of 8.7 days. You know, so every year, their students are being suspended by 8.7 days less. We further, we found that there was a significant, a significant decrease in student absenteeism. The engagement levels in the school started to come up. Now, there was no further resource in our schools, nor is there through partnership um, in working restoratively. There was no further resource provided to these schools so that they could, for instance, target or case manage students who were attending poorly. But we had a decrease in average days, average days missed at school by 3.1 days. And we also had an increase in six key factors that are part of kind of the school review process in Victoria. Um, and they, they go those six, what they call education state domains, there was an increase of 10.5% across each of the schools that worked restoratively um, throughout a three-year period, which we I think is quite remarkable. And I, I'm, really, um, I'm really proud of these schools for being able to achieve that. The model that we deploy with our partner schools is one that you perhaps have seen or perhaps not before. Um, and this is where we speak to this notion of a more respectful restorative model. Um, I think that the disrespect that has come to schools in terms of practicing restoratively before is that the impression has been given to schools that the way you become a restorative school is to use this little card we've got some, with some key questions on it, a script written by an incredible Australian called Terry O'Connell many, many years ago. And a, 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 through a process, through Terry's work as a, as a copper from Wagga, as he calls himself, um, to intervene with young people who were being subjected to the juvenile diversion system, um, juvenile justice system. And it was an alternative to them being incarcerated. And he found some really great results from that. But you've got time when a young person has been detained because they committed a crime. And it's time you don't have in a school. It doesn't mean that these wonderful principles don't have a place in schools, but what it means is that your teachers don't have time to sit down and organise a circle and to get everyone to answer the questions on this card every time someone does something wrong, because there's too many instances. And the nature of those instances is far more informal. We needed a new model to build, to take these principles that work really well around and are really well matched to the way that young people genuinely learn to socialise, research proven, and we needed to be up, find a way to contextualise them in a better way. And so what I did was develop what I've called RP 2.0. Now, if you want to know a, a more about this model, um, it's unpacked in, um, in, in a book that I wrote. I've got to try and get it in front of the screen in the right way in front of me here, called Restoring Teaching. Um, this book we provide free to Australian educators. So what we're going to do um, as part of your pack that will be sent over to you is provide you with um, a link that you'll be able to use to be able to order either yourself or even more um, for your school. All you'll do is, is, is pay for the postage and handling. So we'll keep it nice and cheap for you. Um, and it really is this framework unpacked. You know, um, small shifts in language, 
um, in conduct and in mindset. Now, the language piece, I really love labouring this because it goes to the whole notion of schools and how, for me, the, if it's not practical and it doesn't reach our pedagogy, if it doesn't reach our instructional model, we're, we're not fair income. Um, and so we speak to small changes that can be made in a number of different language ways. For instance, a lot of people who are familiar with restorative practices understand the affective language notion, which is kind of say what you're already going to say, but use a feelings word. Um, but there's so much more. There's so many more opportunities. I thought I'd share with you a quick story, if I may. Um, a teacher that I was working with, a graduate teacher in a in, in a regional New South Wales centre. I won't name it, but um, they they experienced some really high levels of disadvantage in this community. He's got some really tricky kids, and he's doing it hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I walked with Jordan to his classroom, and I said, "What are we working on today, mate?" Because the plan was for me to watch Jordan teach for 30 minutes and provide him with some feedback after it over a coffee. And Jordan said, it's a calling out. It's right. You know, um, he said, they just they just won't stop. I said, okay. You know, and he said, um, so I watched him teach. And across a 30-minute period, I kept a tally in my book of how many students called out. Um, kept the second tally that I shared with Jordan in just a moment. Um, we finished, Jordan sat down, I made him a coffee. He was certainly exhausted after just 30 minutes of teaching this group of year eights. And he um, and he said, do you see? And I said, yep, yeah, I see. <laughs> you know, and he said, so what do you reckon? I said, well, I'm wondering if you can answer me this. What do you think would be the primary motivator of calling out in class? And he got the question right. You know, he said, I reckon it's probably um, attention. I said, I reckon you're right. You know, and um, I said, how many times did you provide attention to the young person in that classroom who called out? And Jordan went, oh, um, he said, I'm a bit of a sucker for it, aren't I? And I said, yeah, a bit, you know. And he said, was it like eight or 10? And I said, no. And he said, 12? And I said, 31? <laughs> and so he was going at better than one a minute. Um, of provide, and sometimes it was positive attention, you know, in that he was, you know, the kid yells out, I need a pen, mister. He just chucks a pen, <laughs> you know. Um, and sometimes it's, I need a pen, mister. Hey, stop calling out in class. A negative, it's a bit of attention, but attention nonetheless. And our attention seeking missiles in our schools really have two currencies, and it's, it's words and eyeballs. And so Jordan realized that he was giving too much. And he said, well, What do I do? And I said, Well, this is what I do. And we call it in our language model a stored response, which means going to the areas that get us off track or emotional in the classroom and coming up with a stored response to eliminate the choice about what we're going to say when we're a little bit frazzled. I said, well, this is what I do. I said, oh, look, I, I, I give half a second of eye contact and a hand. So the hand goes up. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, I can't listen when people call out, but I can listen to you. It's because of the way you're sitting right now. I really appreciate it. Anything you want me to clarify? And I often point out to George, the kid over here that I'm looking at is freaking out. <laughs> yeah. but it's not for that kid, or the one over there. And Jordan said, okay, I, I can try that. You know, He said, what do I do the second time? And I said, don't, no change. Never, ever again. Yeah. And he said, okay. I could see he was sceptical, but he went to teach the rest of his lessons for the, the rest of his periods of the day. Um I ran a, an in class, a, a, um, a staff debrief in the in the afternoon in the library. I remember Jordan coming up the stairs and into the library, and he sort of looked around for me, and um, and then his eyes locked on me. He walked straight at me. He looked kind of fierce, and I thought, oh, I think I broke him. <laughs> um, and Jordan came straight up to me and threw his arms around me and hugged me, and like it was a little funny because I'm six foot four, Jordan's five foot eight. He's got like his head on my chest here, and. So what's going on, mate? <laughs> and he said, um, he just looked up at me and he goes, 9B are putting their hands up. 9B are putting their hands up. I said, that's fantastic, mate. And I sort of pushed his head off my chest. And yeah. Um, and I said, what, what what's going on? And he goes, I just couldn't believe it. He goes, it just really, they, they noticed it. And he goes, and all of a sudden they realized to get my attention, there was just a simple thing they had to do. I said, okay, let's check in on this. Um, I said, did the strategy get rid of calling out in your classes? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, okay. I said, could you tell me to what extent you think it improved it? And he said, about 70 or 80%. Now there's the outcomes based educator in us that says, yeah, what about the 20 or 30? What about that kid? What about that instance? 
Um, and for me, there's the rational restorative educator that says, can we just be happy? Can we just be utterly delighted that we found a strategy that costs Jordan less time and that improves a problematic behaviour in his classroom, the one problematic behaviour that is in the way of student engagement in his classroom more than any of the others by 70 to 80% and perhaps move on to the next behaviour. Um, the ability to impact language in, um, in our cultures is profound. It's our one weapon and we aren't explicit enough about it in our schools. And so we speak to four ways that teachers in your school can impact their language. We talk to effective statements. We talk to stored responses. We talk to positive priming, effectively speaking to the behaviours that we want to see more than the ones we don't. Because if I tell you now, don't think of a pink elephant, I know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and also stakeholder protection, which goes to making your school a psychologically safe environment. We also speak to conduct which says, what are we going to do consistently when we get conflict and wrongdoing? How will we, as the leaders, as the chiefs of this culture, how will we conduct ourselves? And what we say is that we're going to do it in such a way that goes past, present, future as often as possible. My most stolen artifact from this book is a, a methodology called P3P3F3, um, which we provide a, a PDF of, and I'm going to send that through to you as well in the, um, in the pack that comes to you after the webinar. And what we do with that is allow us to solve group problems in schools in nine minutes, three minutes on the past, three minutes on the present, three minutes on the future, build a little list of things that the students can be thanked and congratulated for for, for doing, and then please get out and go back to class. Um, and I've watched year one students get it. Um, and I've watched year 11 students say, I can't believe we've been doing it the wrong way <laughs> all these years. Um, and I've watched school leaders find a lot more time by being able to, one, have an effective way to resolve conflict and wrongdoing, um, but two, to be able to do it in such a way that's genuinely efficient. And the way we conduct ourselves, again, this is why there's an overlap here around pedagogy and philosophy, is that it's around, it has to reach our instructional model. And we want to talk to people about how you can use the immense power of circle architecture. I did this just the other day in an ACT school with a, um, with a fabulous early childhood teacher who frankly was trying too hard, working too hard, and admitted in our conversation after I um, gave her some feedback from her lesson that she's going home every day with a sore throat and a headache and with just no energy to even deal with her own children who, you know, it's quite crazy that she's teaching five-year-olds all day, but she has a couple of five-year-old twins at home as well. I don't know, what, I don't know, I don't know how she gets by. Um, and had her in tears because the strategies that we were able to bring to her were going to allow her to not go home with a sore throat. And part of it was to do with circle architecture and, and, and harnessing the energy that our young people bring to the classroom in a more positive way. We need to start doing, and this is what the architecture does, it manifests an intention to do education with our young people rather than to them. And I want to contend to you that one of the big impacts and you know, solidarity being a Victorian when it comes to the whole remote learning kind of thing that we went through a while back, we don't like to think about it too much, but New South Wales did a lot of it as well. And I think that one of the, 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 the dangers that we've had around doing this in our, around the remote learning in our school and the hangover that's come from it is that teaching's gotten too performative. We have too many teachers putting on a show, too many teachers trying to control the conduct and engagement of their young people rather than just putting architecture in terms of time and space and language involved. It kind of tilts the odds of those young people engaging positively. And we're going to talk with you with people around their mindset. Some of the things that they believe to be true that aren't serving us when it comes to creating cultures where our stakeholders thrive. Um, one of them I've mentioned a few times across the webinar already, which is around the notion of abandoning our attachment to the outcome. Just do the good practice and take 70 to 80% when you can get it. And another that's really needs to be um, unpacked with your staff as you start a restorative journey is where do consequences and punishments actually fit? There is a myth that is being spread by some people who are quite influential in New South Wales schools that restorative practices is an alternative to punishment. What gobbledygook, what nonsense. Restorative, restorative models that are respectful and strong in our schools have a component where the application of consequences and punishments can be done consistently. 
We have a, a, a PDF that we provide our partner schools that makes it really easy for them to see on one page what the three instances are. And this conversation about where's the line, but doesn't there need to be a, still be a punishment for that is gone in these schools. These staff meetings are now able to be focused on practice rather than these meaningful, meaningless ideological arguments about which model is serving us better and which and where's the consequence. And we answer that question. We make it really clear. So let me be clear with you. A good restorative model has consequences and punishments in it. You just need to know where to use them and how to use them. And um, when we provide three simple ways that schools can do that, they, they work it out and they move on. Um, so there's the model and then there's the method. How do you get this done? And so this is where I do want to kind of respectfully point out again that the New South Wales Department of Education doesn't really have the resources available to support the full journey from one side of the, the cliff to the other. Um, so the elements that I researched as being um, critically important for mission success in this regard tend to be, it tends to be 10. Um, one is high quality professional learning, but it cannot stand alone. So if anybody tells you that they can transform the culture of your school with a professional learning workshop, um, you, you need to know they're not telling the truth. They get you excited. Um, they can get you bought in and that's awesome, but that isn't implementation. So the model that you use, the method, I should say, that you use needs to, needs to have a bias for implementation. It's part of the reason that at Real Schools, we won't provide a standalone PL day for, for your school. Um, we just use them to meet people and get them excited enough to do the implementation work, um, to be really honest. Um, so yes, after the great PL experience where people change their minds and get keen to get moving and get a few small wins in their practice quickly, there needs to be further and ongoing in-class support. We need teachers who have these new practices modelled for them. We need co-teaching where they're able to do it side by side with a co colleague to actually foster this sense of a gradual release of responsibility. We're going to get Vygotsky on them. And when they need feedback, just as that teacher that, you know, Jordan in, in nearly said it, nearly said the location, I won't do it. And just as my ACT colleague, you know, did, they need to be in, in a trusting environment where they can receive feedback that can make their life easier. We need high levels of parental engagement. We need mentoring that produces key documentation. Two of those key documentations need to be, one, a back of house plan, an action plan, um, and then also a public declaration, what we call in our restorative schools uh, an SEP. Um, and the, the reason it's orange is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you one and give you a look at one of the schools from one of our partner schools. So um, have a look at their SEP um, because we contend that there's a really, there's a, a conversation happening in every Australian school that says uh, we need to get everyone on the same page when it comes to practice. Um, we say probably should write the page then, um, and we do. And so that's really exciting because it reduces a lot of community anxiety about what the school is going to do in this situation. We do this. You want to know anything more about it? Come and talk to us. But woo, woo, we've got this. And it provides an, a higher level of trust from the community to the school because their reference point about what to expect of the school has changed. We further enhance the shifting of that reference point with a really simple and steady comms plan for your school to be able to communicate with others what your practice intentions are in a really drip fed kind of way. We provide coaching for your teachers. You're going to need that because teachers at both end of the career continuum, you know, the early career teachers who need, you know, are often high on enthusiasm but low on capacity. And then I'll get my fingers in the right spot. Our, um, our teachers that sometimes are at the other end that can be characterised by sometimes being high in capacity but low on enthusiasm. There's different types of conversations that need to be had with both of those teachers so that they don't get stuck on the wrong side of an implementation barrier. There needs to be a huge amount of resourcing because like I mentioned, the PL day won't satisfactorily help people make that full shift, that mindset shift that they need to go all the way along the tightrope. Um, without retreating. Um, so what we need to do is to provide them with lots of support around that. I'm going to send you through uh, a couple of resources. One's going to be a, an article that we provide for our teachers. Um, we provide dozens of these. And also a little video, which is a staff meeting conversation starter that unpack, as all of the articles and videos do, a little key component of that that allows, um, that allows people to revisit, readjust in an ongoing way so that the effort drops out um, of needing to remember to be restorative and we'll need to measure impact. Um, one of the things I'll do is send you through the data that I looked at before. 
but the tools need to also measure impact within your individual school. We need milestones. We need celebration points. We need to be able to prove to people who are perhaps reluctant that this stuff does make a difference and it makes a difference in the things that matter. We need tools that will actually allow leaders to be more diagnostic in their work. We need tools that, that, that demonstrate measurable improvements in, in confidence and competence for your staff. And we'll need tools to prove that both the social outcomes for young people, how they sense of self, what their sense of self is like, but also what they believe the school climate is like are also attended to. And we'll need to build projects around those so that they can get moving with them. Um, I mentioned the videos at the start and, and the, that my impetus for showing them to you was to give you hope um, that this is possible and very doable and that it isn't that hard. Um, you have five other schools as well um, in New South Wales that we've been working with across about the last 18 months or so now. Um, they're in the Eastern Creek region, so effectively in Western Sydney. And I am so, so proud of not only implementation, not only the implementation that they've embarked upon at a local school level, um, and we're talking about Rudy Hill High School, Plumpton High School, St. Clair High School, Erskine Park High School and Colleton High School. But the fact that collectively they now have a really clear protocol statement that they have made to the made to the community that says that, you know what, we're all on this journey together. We're all learning from each other. In a lot of ways, you don't need a school shop between us because we've all made commitments around what our purpose is um, around having strong, safe relational cultures. And we've made really clear statements to the community about how we speak to each other, about how we conduct ourselves and about the thinking, beliefs and research that underpin our mindsets. And this really beautiful collaborative piece of work for me is, um, is wonderful evidence of what's possible when we decide to collaborate um, rather, rather than compete. Um, so what can you do about this? Um, one of the things that I want to give you the compulsion to do and what, again in the pack that we'll send through to you after today we'll send through a flyer and um and a registration link um for some workshops that i'll be running in sydney um on the the 19th and the 20th of july so the first workshop on the 19th is called restorative classrooms strong classrooms it is should talk it up more um it's it's the one day crash course so it's the opportunity for your people to get genuinely excited and get some quick wins um, around practicing restoratively. And if you would like a little tribe of people in your school going, oh, this stuff's actually really good. It's not just stuff that we're being made to do. Um, you should send a couple. You should send a few. Um, so places are filling up really quickly. Um, but that workshop was a, is a full day workshop. It's on the 19th. Then on the 20th, I'm going to run a, a four-hour seminar um, for school leaders um, that's titled The Art of School Culture Leadership, um, because it is artistry. Um, it isn't science. It isn't follow this formula and you'll get this, um, because we all know that when it comes to culture and people, that's nonsense. Um, because you can't invite a variable like hundreds of young people with coursing with disadvantage and hormones um, into your experiment and expect it not to blow up or be at least be impacted in some way what we need to do is to paint a picture what we need to do is to actually get clear about what the picture is of the culture that you're looking for your looking for for your school and then treat the brush strokes as opportunities to paint that in such a way that people want to be a part of it people want to step into into that work of art with you and I know it sounds a little ethereal, but the actual work of learning work of learning through this on the day is incredibly practical. Um, so it's a four hour opportunity from 10 till two. I'm gonna run it on the 20th of July. And for you and any of the other school leaders that you have in your, um, in your school, I'd, I'd love to meet you there. Um, to round things out a little bit for you today, I just wanna finish on the note that you could ignore this. Um, you've got every opportunity to say that, you know what, it's kind of, you know, I've said that, yeah, I know that it was in some of these, but there's other things that I could do in there. Um, there I, I could look at the IAR stuff and I could do the restorative work as a, as a, as a bare minimum. Um, but I do contend that I think you'll get stuck in the middle. And I do contend that some of your best practitioners will fall off. If we don't start to bring work to our schools that reduces their workload, that saves them time, 
if we don't bring in a really clear restorative model that allows them to not be bound above a paperwork threshold, which is what can happen sometimes when policies like I, the IAR policy are implemented in schools. Um, if we don't work on the key stresses around student behaviour, around, around workload and around issues with parents, um, then we all lose some. We already are. We already are. And um, I'd like that not to be the case. I would love this restorative work to underpin a, a turning point in the teacher workforce crisis that we've got by dealing with the issues that really speak um, specifically to why teachers are leaving. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is to have a yak about your school. So if you would like to have that conversation, then by all means, there's a couple of things you could, you could do about that. You could put something in the chat box now to say, Adam, get in touch. Um, you could um, send us an email at info at realschools.com.au. We could have a look at that panic that I sent through, which will provide you with all the details you need in order to, for us to have a chat about your school. I'm often at pains to point out, we can't, you, you can't sign up for partnership from our website. It's not that simple. Um, we need to learn about you. You need to learn about us. And, um, and we need to tailor both our method and our model to suit your really unique context. You bring the context, we'll bring the content, and in the middle, the implementation happens. And if that sounds not like something you, you'd like to happen, then um, and we should talk. We should talk. We should have a chat about that. Hey, thank you. Um, whether we do talk again or not, um, I want to thank you for continuing to do um, this um, challenging, um, laborious sometimes, um, but incredibly worthy work. Um, I'm in awe of every school that I walk into in um, in New South Wales and indeed across the country. Um, and they're not just our partner schools. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of what you've been able to do to stay in the profession, to stay in the game and to keep giving our young people a better future. Thanks heaps for your time this afternoon. Um, I hope that we can connect again really soon. Okay, bye for now.